Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to the Road to Recovery 2013, a showcase of events. The Recovery Month observance held each September celebrates people in recovery, raises our awareness and understanding of mental and substance use disorders, and recognizes those who work in the field of behavioral health. The 2013 theme, Join the Voices for Recovery, together on Pathways to Wellness, highlighted the fact that there are many unique ways people can prevent behavioral health issues, seek treatment, and sustain recovery. The theme also highlights the importance of mental, physical, and emotional well-being, as well as the value of family, friends, and community members throughout the recovery journey. The journey of recovery is a shared experience. Those struggling with mental and substance use disorders share their stories with each other and give each other encouragement. Families, friends, and whole communities share in the recovery experience by creating systems of support that are critical to the progress of persons in recovery. Mental and substance use disorders are significant public health concerns that affect millions of Americans each year. However, many people are not aware of these simple facts. Prevention works, treatment is effective, and people can and do recover from these conditions. For well over 20 years, National Recovery Month has served to educate Americans that mental health services, addiction treatment, and recovery support services can enable people who have a mental disorder, a substance use disorder, or both, to live healthy and rewarding lives. We know that nearly one in 10 Americans struggles with a substance use disorder and that about one in five Americans has a mental health problem. As we hear their stories, we learn that while the journey of recovery follows many different pathways, Progress on every one of those pathways depends on relationships marked by care, support, and respect. Good morning. I'm Dr. H. Wesley Clark, the director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. On behalf of SAMHSA and our parent organization, the Department of Health and Human Services, welcome. And thank you for joining us for the unveiling of the 2012 National Survey of Drug Use and Health Results. We're also celebrating the 24th Annual National Recovery Month. By pairing these two events, it gives us an opportunity to celebrate those who are in recovery while also remembering that there are many more who have yet found that path. The theme of the 24th Annual National Recovery Month observance is Join the Voices for Recovery together on pathways to wellness. It emphasizes that while each person finds his or her own unique path to recovery, our common goal is wellness. Through recovery, the people we celebrate during September have overcome mental and substance use challenges, and in so doing, have improved their overall health as well as the health and well-being of their families, friends, and communities. This press conference always provides us the opportunity to recognize and celebrate the accomplishments of the millions of Americans in recovery from mental illness and addiction. It's also time to applaud the families, the loved ones, and friends who support them and the behavioral health providers who help them regain their health. It's also an opportunity to share the podium with others who support the important work of recovery and wellness. People like our partners at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, especially Dr. Kul Gil, uh, Gil Kurlikowski. Uh, we're gonna hear from, I think I just called you a doctor. I know. Um, <laughs> we'll hear from Director Kurlikowski in just a few minutes, and we'll, just, uh, we'll also hear from those at the head table who know a lot about recovery and about achieving wellness. As we recognize in September National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, it's worth noting that not so long ago the word recovery was kind of absent from the drug policy discussion. 
Recovery Month reminds us that our ultimate goal is not the successful implementation of a prevention program or a successful treatment discharge, but rather safer, healthier, more resilient, and more prosperous individuals, families, and communities. And reaching the goal requires creating avenues for individuals to achieve and sustain recovery. It requires us to create opportunities for individuals to fully enjoy and contribute to the community. My name is Jenna, and I am a person in long-term recovery. For me, that means I haven't used a drink or a drug since I was 24. Recovery has given me an awareness that I've never had before, the ability to live in the moment and really appreciate my surroundings, everything from watching the way the sunlight illuminates the leaves on the trees to feeling a warm breeze on my face. I don't take life for granted anymore. I'm actually participating in my life, and I'm no longer just existing. It wasn't always like that, though. There was a time when I didn't want to take part in life. I wanted to run away from it. When I was 13, there was a knock on my door two days after Christmas. The police were standing there, and they told me that there had been an accident and that I needed to call my mom. What I soon found out was that my dad had committed suicide. In that moment, the world as I knew it changed. Everything stopped, and I just wanted to run. I didn't want to face that reality. I didn't know how to cope with those feelings and I just wanted to escape. And for me, that escape came in the form of drugs and alcohol. Fortunately, somebody was looking out for me because one day my mom drugged me to court and that judge said three words that would change my life yet again. Incarceration without bail. I had the opportunity to plead into a program called drug court. And drug court afforded me the ability to go to a 90-day inpatient rehabilitation program. And it was there that I gained so much insight about myself. And I really learned how to live life on life's terms and not have to put a substance in my body to numb me. In 2010, I graduated from that drug court program. And that day, I realized if I can do this, I can do anything I put my mind to. So I made the decision to go back to school. And as Dr. Clark said, in 2012, I graduated with my bachelor's degree. Since then, I've decided to continue my education. And this fall is my first semester as a graduate student working on my master's. It's amazing that I have a purpose. I'm able to give back to my community what was given to me. To say the least, my childhood was less than horrific. My family and I enjoyed a middle-class suburban existence. I excelled academically and participated in several extracurricular activities. My emotional development, however, um, was, I would say, severely compromised. I suffered from an extremely poor body image, as I was classified as overweight, and my self-esteem and self-worth were non-existent. In May of 1997, at the age of 12, I won a, a D.A.R.E. essay contest hosted by my local municipality. And the topic of that contest was why I won't try drugs. And then in June of 1997, one month later, I started smoking marijuana. The next 15 years of my life, I struggled in the grasp of addiction, characterized by an increasingly typical progression from prescription, uh, prescription opiate usage to an intravenously delivered heroin dependency. And I, you know, I believe that um, many Americans still think of such usage as predominantly an urban problem, but that is not the case. I was not raised in a broken, impoverished, abusive household, but rather a loving, middle-class, suburban environment. And despite my malady, I became a student athlete, able to graduate from a parochial high school with a 4.4 GPA, and to earn a full academic scholarship to one of the top 10 business schools in the nation. My addiction brought me to institutions, to run-ins with the law, to near-death experiences, and to the funerals of five good friends, all of those people under the age of 33 years old. And needless to say, I am fortunate to be standing here before you all today. On April 25th, 2012, in a moment of abject despair, I made a decision to change my life. I checked myself into a detox facility in New Jersey the following day. After an eight-day detox, I checked into a rehab facility in West Palm Beach, Florida. Today, I'm accountable. In recovery, I've been able to acquire a New Jersey general contractor's license and to form an LLC as a sole proprietor. Today, I'm a small uh, business owner of a growing company. I'm a productive member of society, and today, 
I am once again a contributing citizen of the United States of America. I'm a mental health advocate in Puerto Rico. I am the director of Fundación Nuestra Mente, which is a nonprofit organization I established in the year 2011 to share not just my story, but stories of people that are too afraid to really reveal their own stories. I am a certified peer specialist and just recently actually be, uh, became the community coordinator for a Puerto Rico government program aimed at helping children and adolescents with severe emotional disturbances in under underserved communities. I am a person with multiple mental health diagnoses, and it's been a really difficult process. I was diagnosed at a time where it was not only not cool, it was also unheard of to talk about mental health in your communities without being stigmatized, without being made fun of. My mother and I had to seek treatment in the States. My mother lost her, tw her job of 28 years trying to help me, and my family completely stranded away, did not support us, and made her cry every single day because of the fact that they could not understand what I was going through. I battled through obesity, weighing in at almost 300 pounds, because I was sick of society. Everyone to me was the enemy, so the only person I could count on was myself. I tried multiple suicidal attempts, including throwing myself off a car while my mom was driving. I did self-mutilation. Why? Not because I wanted to commit suicide, but because I was so tired of my anxiety attacks. I was so tired of not knowing what to do that the only way was punishing myself until the physical pain overcame the emotional pain. I didn't see any future in myself, but that was until I started to learn about wellness. I learned that throughout the entire process, everyone was so focused on my mental health that they weren't wor worried about me being obese. They weren't worried about me exercising, other things that I eventually had to learn by myself. And once I did, it came to a point where I forgot I had a mental illness. I forgot that I had anxiety attacks. I had all these intrusive thoughts. And in that process, I realized it's like a magical solution. Turns out you just have to exercise. You have to do all these great things, a holistic approach. I've been able to be off medication for five years, four or five different anxiety, for three different anxiety disorders. And it is because of that, simply because I focus so much on the good things that the bad, I don't just overcome them. I, ba I break through them because that is exactly what everyone in this room and around the nation has to do. Because honestly, if you told me four years ago, that I was gonna be talking about a press conference about my recovery story, I'd be laughing at you right now. We have to not just empower the consumers, we have to empower everybody. And it is through National Recovery Month, National Wellness Week that we do that. I am a person in recovery with uh, mental health issues. Um, I went into foster care at age 15 and aged out and consequently um, self-medicated and abused alcohol for many years as a way to uh, deal with those unmet mental health needs, including depression and PTSD. Um, since then, and I have learned about recovery and other ways to manage, I have uh, dedicated my work and my life to improving outcomes for young people, um, including the areas of foster care, youth engagement and leadership, adoption, mental health, and trauma. As the Executive Director of Youth Move National, or Youth Motivating Others Through Voices of Experience, we work to improve services and systems for youth and young adults who have lived experience in these systems. We support chapters, 68 chapters across 33 different states of young people who seek to engage in systems change and to help promote positive outcomes for their peers as well. It's also important that we partner together and the mental health and substance abuse field work together and model that connection um, because they are both essential for us to all be well. And I want to say thank you to SAMHSA for leading this way. Um, it is very crucial that we do unite and we do bring supports to each other um, across substance abuse and mental health because they don't operate independently within ourselves. Why would they operate independently elsewhere? And so to unite those, and SAMHSA is really bringing those two together and supporting that um, connection and that support for our youth and young adults in this country. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Recovery Month Planning Partners Luncheon. Today's discussion, recognition, and celebration of prevention, treatment, and recovery is hosted by the National Association for Children of Alcoholics and the Entertainment Industries Council. 
To begin today's event, please join me in welcoming a pioneer of edutainment and depiction of health and social issues. He is the founder, president, and CEO of the Entertainment Industries Council and the award-winning executive producer and creator of the PRISM Awards. This is the world's only nationally televised show honoring the accurate depictions of substance use and mental health. And our first speaker today is none other than Mr. Brian Dyack. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, the, the voice from beyond that you're hearing is uh, Skylar Jackson, our external communication and program director, and the producer and host of our new internet television network, EIC-TV. The network is launching live as I speak. For the first time, members of the organizations represented in recovery supporters across the country will be able to participate in the luncheon awards ceremony uh, virtually and interact through the EICnetwork.tv website, which is integrated with Facebook and Twitter. Those at home will also be able to watch exclusive video clips, some of which were created by those in this room that are here with us today. So thank you to our media partners at 20th, 21st Century Fox for supporting this unique webcast, and thank you to SAMHSA and all the organizations who have been putting the word out across the country to invite others to this webcast. On behalf of 21st Century Fox and John Landgraf, who is the president of FX, who will be showcasing this, uh, the PRISM Awards, and chairman of the PRISM Honorary Committee and trustee of EIC, um, it's our honor to support the national recovery effort and to be the media partner today um, with EIC. For nearly two decades, the EIC has paid tribute to the accurate, honest, authentic, and engaging depiction of important behavioral health issues through the PRISM Awards. Celebrating hundreds of writers, producers, and directors who rewrite stereotypes to become relatable, sympathetic characters that resonate with the audience is very important, and that's how these awards are, are looked at. Now in its 17th year, the PRISM Award submissions are now well into the thousands and seen by millions within reach um, from Hollywood to Capitol Hill. And believe me, there's a lot of similarities between the two. <laughs> the 17th Annual PRISM Awards Showcase will premiere on FX and will remain on demand through March 30th, 2014. We look forward to working with EIC to help bring the proactive productions of our industry into the limelight as service to all of you who dedicate your lives to this very important issue. We thank you for what you are doing every day and are pleased to be part of bringing your message into the homes of our viewers. He wrote probably the first and one of the best ever written books of stories. We are all talking about recovery stories. He wrote Courage to Change, and when I developed my educational program back in Michigan, that was mandatory reading with a book report due from every single one of my volunteers because it told the real stories of real people. So my storyteller friend also, Dennis Holy. I used to say kiddingly when I would do a, a COA talk uh, that I grew up in a family of five kids and two distant relatives, my mother and father. I've amended that a little bit to realize that while it is a good line and it does get a good laugh, uh, that was a very, very uh, difficult childhood, a very painful childhood. I think it's important that, that we realize that this word loneliness and this pain of childhood is essential to the message of recovery. This is a recovery month, 24 years for recovery month, 30 years for the National Association for Children of Alcoholics, but do not set out the difference in your minds between the recovering addict and alcoholic, and we're very public about it, many of us are, with the turn the clock back, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, or for some of the young people that will be joining me in a minute, turning the clock back just 10 years, and the lives of young children. 
So I want to talk about a very exciting campaign that we just unveiled a little over a month ago on Capitol Hill, and it's called the OK to Talk campaign. The primary goal of this campaign is to end the stigma associated with talking about mental health issues. Our president and CEO, Senator Gordon Smith, has been a longtime mental health advocate. Sadly, later this month, it will be 10 years since his son took his own life after a tragic struggle with mental illness. And Senator Smith has been just phenomenal in bringing together the mental health community and broadcasters to really have us use our megaphone to make this a national discussion and to get people talking about it. And so our campaign had a very clear and focused message. It's okay to talk about mental health. There are resources and treatments available for you that are effective. And if you know someone who's struggling, please help them get the help that they need. So I really encourage you to work with your local TV and radio stations. They are very receptive to doing things to bring mental health out of the shadows and into the national dialogue. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Bashad Sheldon, and on behalf of Braeburn Pharmaceuticals, I'm honored, really honored, to be here with all of you supporting Recovery Month um, and um, the message that you already heard, but some things are really good to say again and again, uh, which is that prevention works, treatment is effective, and recovery does happen. People can and do recover. Each year, thousands of people in cities and towns across this nation help to organize Recovery Month events. In recent years, we have seen Recovery Month become an international movement with events held in many other countries around the world. In 2013, over 900 Recovery Month events were held in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, and numerous countries outside of the U.S. Here and abroad, Recovery Month events bring together the courageous people in recovery, the caring service providers that work tirelessly to support people in recovery, and family members and friends who are instrumental in initiating and sustaining recovery. Community events are an effective way to deliver Recovery Month's key messages to a variety of audiences. There are also many fun and creative ways to get the message out. We saw celebrations, conferences, parades, rallies, walks, sporting events, block parties, motorcycle rides, dances, and art shows. At these events, we heard encouraging words in support of recovery and calls for action to support people in recovery throughout the year with critical support services like housing, education, and employment. We got any people in recovery out there? Recovery Month events make the faces of recovery visible in the community. We want to thank everyone who helped organize Recovery Month events. Your creativity and dedication is inspiring to us all.
The stories of recovery are the stories of our family members, our friends, and the people we meet every day in our communities. As they succeed in living self-directed lives and achieving their full potential, we see the benefits of recovery, not only for the individual, but for their family, friends, and community. Just as we see people from all walks of life engaged in the recovery process, so also do we see the incredible variety of paths that people in recovery take. We find that there are many different pathways to achieve the common goal of hope, health, and wellness. As we take a moment to recognize the success of the 2013 Recovery Month of Servants, we are reminded that this is a time to turn our attention to 2014. I hope this show inspires you to get involved and to organize a Recovery Month event for next September. You can begin now by going to the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov for information on how to get started. As you can see from the events in 2013, the type of Recovery Month event you choose to organize can be whatever your imagination and creativity inspires you to do. Thank you for everything you do to support recovery. Let's keep up this exciting work in the coming year, and I sincerely hope that your event will be highlighted in our 2014 Showcase of Events. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click on the Video Radio Web tab. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.